All right, I hope you brought your sleeping bags and camping equipment because this is going to be a long night. <laughs> no, uh, this is a presentation that's normally 45 minutes to an hour, so I took a lot of um, content out of this, and I'm going to try to do it in a half an hour. And uh, I've got some extra time, so that's good. And um, oh, where's the little, there it is, pointer thingy spotlight. All right. Um, there we go. You're going to see um, some slides and some quotes. You're going to see a lot of quotes in this presentation coming up. And um, you can read those at your discretion, OK? I'll just keep talking over them. The reason this uh, presentation is called Alchemy is because um, in the design of theme parks, and I'm sure it's the same for theater and cinema and uh, web pages and apps, um, there are a lot of paradoxes and contradictions um, and rule breaking when it comes to um, things like guidelines. Like, what is our, you know, what's the SOP um, for going forward? And so, this is really an outgrowth of some work that I did um, partly on my own at Imagineering in the last couple years as I began to gather um, tribal knowledge that I was afraid of um, getting lost. Um, through history, <laughs> and um, thought that it would be a good idea to begin to um, put some of that together for a possible book project, because I'm working on another uh, potential book project with Disney coming up. And so I, I kept um, gathering all of this information and images and quotes and putting them into a keynote until the keynote became like a giant 288-page uh, document. <laughs> uh, we're not going to go through 288 pages. We're going to go through about uh, 70 slides here. And um, it's called, uh, oh, I wanted to also just point out, um, what did I want to point out? It's probably on the next slide. That the inspiration for this um, came from this book that was a great book when I was growing up called The Art of Animation. It was the only serious book about animation that was available in the 60s and 70s. In fact, it was written in the 50s. And all, there, there were no other serious books. There were th things like how to draw, you know, Elmer Fudd. But um, there wasn't anything that really took a serious look at the animation business and the, and the art. And that was followed um, I don't know, 20 or 30 years later by, the, uh, by a more comprehensive book called The Illusion of Life that was actually written by two of the great nine old men animators. And that went uh, into deeper and greater detail. But I know that a lot of us, well, some of us, well, maybe just me, uh, grew up with these educational films um, that we were kind of weaned on again in the, in the 60s and 70s. Um, that was produced by the Disney company that showed you, like that's Donald in Mathemagic Land up there, the spotlight's not working. Um, yes, it's a great film. <laughs> it's a great film artistically, but it's a great film because it showed, it didn't explain, it really kind of showed you so that the ideas and the concepts were cemented in your head. So that was the inspiration for some kind of a document or some kind of a book that would delve into the art of placemaking, themed entertainment, because no one's really done a book like that, but it's gotta be um, visually based so that, you know, so that even if you don't speak the language, if you don't speak English, you can see it and see what it means. Uh, it really works great as a keynote presentation. I, I begin to wonder if it would be as effective as a book. Um, so you're going to see about a third of what was assembled for this, and it's broken up into some chapters, and there may, may be a lack of continuity because, you know, because I've taken some pieces out, so um, pardon for that. And also, uh, I do need to do the disclaimer that uh, I also do not speak on behalf of the Walt Disney Company. <laughs> uh, I no longer work for the Walt Disney Company. I left uh, a year and a half ago, and it was an amicable party, uh, parting, and they are you know, still supporting me in some of my efforts, and I'm still supporting them. Uh, but I just wanted to lay that out there. And some of the images are copyright Walt Disney. Some of the images I took myself, but most of them I just ripped off the internet. <laughs> Because that's what you do. Because Walt, like myself, is not an optimist, but an optimal behaviorist, which means that every day of your life, if you behave well, you begin to feel well. Huh? 
So that's not false, that's real. You get your work done every day, and at the end of a week, a month, a year, you turn around and say, hey, look what I did. So you feel good. That's real optimism, the optimal behavior. So that's, I think, the, the way he behaved. And he could look back at the end of each year and see his behavior, and it made him want to go on. So that's kind of Disney's North Star, in a way. I mean, um, Disney is about, of course, entertainment that reaffirms the best qualities of life and the human condition. And of course, a lot of people think of the legendary advancements in the entertainment arts and technologies. Um, but I think there's like a sense that as products from animated film to all the way to the parks and resorts are motiva motivated by a genuine concern and respect for people, uh, particularly going back to Walt Disney in that era, and I think that's kind of what carried the affinity for Disney on through um, the decades. Um, there seems to be, a, uh, beyond just the business aspect, a dedication to the community and the recognition that the positive um, impact that the company can make on the world. So I have a pet peeve, and that's fake quotes. <laughs> Uh, Walt Disney did not say this. It's a nice sentiment. It's not unlike, you know, something you would think he would say, um, but he didn't say it. <laughs> All our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. I don't think he said that either. Laughter is timeless. Imagination has no age, no dreams, or uh, has no age, and dreams are forever. Um, I'm always leery of any kind of a quote that comes in about five or six different font types. <laughs> he did not say those. Well, he may have said those. But I think they were kind of platitudinal, you know, platitudinal uh, sayings that were kind of come up with by maybe some of his writers. Here's an authentic quote from Walt Disney. And that was really kind of more in his... Um, thinking, I think, was just, uh, you know, nose to the grindstone and um, keep on swimming, <laughs> basically. By the way, that's an authentic Walt Disney signature, too, just to keep this very, very authentic. That's really what his signature looked like. Here's another quote, real quote from Walt. Whatever you do, do it well. Do it so well that when people see you do it, they will want to come back and see you do it again, and they'll want to bring others and show them how well you do what you do. And that kind of um, sums up the ethos, I guess, the working ethos of uh, the Disney company back then, and much of that still continues on to this day. The Japanese call it um, Kaizen, which is the um, continuous improvement and uh, taking a long-term approach to work that systematically seeks to achieve small incremental changes in order to improve um, efficiency and quality. And that's, what, that's how the Disney company and, and what you know and love is, you know, Disney Animation and the parks grew out of that step-by-step -step, um, experimentation um, and not being afraid to move ahead to the next step and taking that momentum you know, that was learned, you know, in the recent past forward to the, uh, you know, to the future. The, here's another authentic quote. When you're curious, you find lots of interesting things to do. And that, uh, it, there's a lot of quotes from Walt Disney that are true quotes about curiosity. And he, that really was a true thing, that he was, uh, he, if he got interested in something, then you would see that in a film <laughs> or in one of his um, animations or in the park, like when he went to Europe and went to the Matterhorn back in the 50s and said, oh, I've got to have one of these for my park. <laughs> the same with the monorail. So all of these things he'd get interested in, and then um, he would take that curiosity further to the next step to see what he could do with that. But here's something you don't hear a lot, um, especially from the Disney company, is they didn't invent the theme park, they just made them a lot better. So big, spectacular attractions um, have been around for a long time, elaborate, technology-driven attractions that go back, I mean, ones like this go back to the um, old turn of the century or even earlier. I wish I could get the spot. Oh, there it is. Yay! <laughs> That's a simulator show.
from 1900 that was at the Paris Expo. It was a giant ship that you, or a, a miniature ship that you stood on, and then there was a scenic backdrop that rolled behind it, and the whole thing, you know, pitched up and down, just like a real ship. These are all big, elaborate, um, you know, show action systems or ride systems that uh, predate Disneyland. This Palais Mirage Walt Disney went in in the 30s, and elements of that ended up in the Tiki Room and the Haunted Mansion. And of course, Tivoli Gardens was a place that Walt Disney really liked, and um, went there several times um, before the opening of Disneyland and after. And it was really an inspiration, because it proved that you could create a place, a successful place, um, that could have flowers and waterfalls and didn't, you know, it didn't have to be a carnival, basically. Disney did not invent animatronics or automatons. Those have been around for uh, centuries. I won't go through every one, but some of them smoked opium. <laughs> and special effects and illusions, uh, they were projecting uh, projections on water screens in Versailles in the 1800s, um, they've been doing um, amazing um, special effects as found in the Haunted Mansion with glass using reflection in the 1850s. This is kind of the coolest one though. This is like a big palace in Vienna that has all sorts of water effects, including these like practical joke seats where you'd sit down for a banquet and the seats would pop jet you in the rear end. <laughs> Going back to 1650. And then there's also a lot of um, hidden forces that are at work. So it's easy to say, oh, it's the appeal of Mickey Mouse or Cinderella or Elsa and Anna. And that's partly true, but there's a lot of stuff that's um, in the background that you don't see. And all of these places here are places that people continue to go back to because there's something about those places, something about the, the chi, the energy, um, the arrangement of the buildings, the color, the history that compel people to return again and again. On the right are kind of the Disney versions of <laughs> of those kinds of edifices. You know, there's the cathedral, but if you're a kid, you're 10 or 12 years old, that cathedral is kind of scary. The Supreme Court's kind of scary, it still is, <laughs> as an adult. Uh, the Panama Canal. Um, but on the right, you kind of see the, you know, the, the way that these same kinds of things can be made beautiful and inviting and places that you want to go to, not avoid. I came back from Paris one time about 10 years ago, went to Disneyland, and I looked on the side of Sleeping Beauty's castle, and I called John Hench over at Imagineering. I said, I just noticed something about Sleeping Beauty's castle. There's a spire there that I saw last on top of Notre Dame and the Palais de Justice in Paris. I said, how long has that been there on Sleeping Beauty's castle? He said, 20 years. I said, who put it there? He said, Walt did. I said, why? Because he loved it. I said, oh, that's why I love Walt Disney. It cost $100,000 to build a spire you didn't need. Uh, <laughs> the secret of Disney is doing things you don't need and doing them well, and then you realize you needed them all along. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> So imagine you know, what life would be if um, cities and towns didn't have um, beautiful things like this that aren't you know, necessarily needed. But there are things in the world that aren't needed, um, like these pills here, they're not needed. <laughs> or this house, where <laughs> should have kind of stopped with all the gratuitous bric-a-brac about, you know, just reeled it in before spending too much money. And even in, our, in the Disney parks, there are things that you don't need, like all of those rails, you know, Disney and Imagineering, they put rails where you need rails legally and where it makes sense to put them. And 
sometimes people go overboard and, and put too many of them. You know, the, these statutory signs that go up, um, you have to put them in, but you as a paying guest don't really need that as part of your daily experience. So um, story is something that was brought up earlier, I think, by Darren, that sometimes it can be overemphasized or, um, you know, what do we even mean by story? And in a film or a theater show or a narrative, uh, you know, there's a, there, is, there are rules for what you need to have a successful story. But when you're walking around a space and you can choose where to go, you have to put a new set of rules on top of that. So I always use the term premise in, in terms of theme park. What's the premise? What's the basic idea that you're going into versus plot, which is something that really doesn't belong too much in a theme park unless you're ta talking about a, the you know, a theatrical show. Even in the two-dimensional world that we designed for the motion pictures, there's the implication of space. In fact, we use many of the techniques we had learned in the films and applied it to actual third dimension. And when we set up a kind of story in our own mind about what it was, we would establish a, a, an imaginary long shot as if we were taking it with the motion pictures. So story should really be implicit in establishing where you are in a place like Disneyland. I'm going to use Disneyland as an example. You're going to see it mostly um, as the image system because people here are more familiar with it than Disney World. Um, but, uh, you know, the organizing of a space has to be functional uh, as well as narrative. And so everything from the restaurants and, um, to the lands themselves, to the parks and the overall resorts, uh, it's important to maintain a certain continuity, but not to go overboard to the point where you're overloading people and they feel like they have to, you know, follow a particular, you know, like, what am I missing right now? So context is a very important part of how story should be um, implemented in a particular uh, part of the park. So this um, Ferris wheel, <laughs> thankfully, is not in any Disney park. Uh, but a personal story, someone was trying to get me to put this in one of the frontier lands <laughs> in one of the parks uh, when I had responsibility for Disneyland Paris for a few years. And they needed um, some additional capacity. They needed it quickly. And you know, it was more a question of expediency than it was money. And so someone saw that this company makes this and it's like, why, why don't we just have this in there? You know? uh, it's like, well, it doesn't belong there. Well, what do you mean it doesn't belong there? It's frontier land and those are covered wagons. <laughs> Don't you believe in supporting the story? <laughs> and like, you know, what do you say to that? Obviously, it doesn't belong there. Uh, the context of the land does not support a big industrial machine like that that does not look like it's from 1850. So these are things that sometimes become difficult to explain, and sometimes the story card is turned around and used against you, and you're like, you have to come up with some good verbal ammo. So that's why I came up with a slide that said there's basically these different levels um, that you dive into, you know, as you, as you leave the, the everyday world and burrow deeper into the park, you've got kind of these six thresholds from the everyday world into the resort. That's like, you know, leaving the freeway and, and going, um, heading across the property line into the parking area on the edge of the kingdom, stepping into the kingdom, transitioning into the lands, inside the land, and the attractions and shows themselves where it's most important to have total show immersion. But each one of those sh thresholds has their own set of anachronisms. So going into the everyday, from the everyday world into the resort, you've got tra um, traffic directionals, toll booths, parking lot, um, transactions like the toll, going into the parking lot, and it's not the place where you can do 100% theming without anachronisms. And on the edge of the kingdom, you still have the monorails going past the Victorian train station, <laughs> and you've got trams, and you've got ticketing, and at Disney World, you have you know, boats, and, and you know, there's no way that you can assign a time period or a geography to, to any of those. 
So um, you'd be wasting your time on, you know, one, two, and three by, by being too, um, you know, to, to be enforcing the thematic rules too heavily. It's when you really get into four, five, and six where you have to really become kind of the fussy, um, the fussy designer. So it's better to visually show just because it's, it's fun to do in Keynote, and I always like to challenge myself, like, what can you do with Keynote? So going from the everyday world into the resort, you've got the parking structure, you've got the toll booth and the bad news about what you're about to pay to go into the parking lot. <laughs> but, you know, you can do a little bit. You can, you know, color code the different floors so you remember where you are. And then going from the parking lot closer to the park on the edge of the kingdom, you have kind of another set of um, parameters. So it becomes a little more themed, a little more designy, a little more pleasant, but it's still kind of a mashup. You know, Buzz Lightyear on the ticket booths, on the Victorian ticket booths. And, but, you know, what do you expect? You're not really in the park yet. So now you're on the edge of the park. You're going into the park, but you still have um, guest services and amenities that need to be addressed, like, you know, strollers and wheelchairs, and then the turnstiles themselves. It's really when you begin to step into the kingdom that, um, you know, the, the big, heavy, creative juice uh, begins to flow. And so, of course, Main Street is a highly, highly themed, elaborate um, uh, land within Disneyland. It's the first land that you go into, and it seems like it would be a hermetic time period um, that you would not want to violate at all um, in either you know, the time setting or in the geography of it. But it's the first experience, and as such, uh, for many, it's an orientation, uh, especially if it's your first visit um, to the park. So certain exceptions are made even on Main Street that become anachronisms like cavalcade type, you know, parades. In this case, it's the three caballeros on Main Street. Uh, or the lockers, you know, you have things like lockers and City Hall. Um, so those are, you know, minor violations on the, what I call the, you know, the CCNRs like homeowners associations have. And then even as you get further into the land still, even though things are uh, much more, now much more um, environmentally themed, you still have anachronisms to deal with. You have the horse-drawn trolleys with a gothic medieval castle in the background. You have the beautiful Matterhorn with a modern monorail running in front of it. You have the tiki room that you can still see to this day with the Victorian Plaza Pavilion on one side and the tiki room on the other, which I love. I love that, actually. It's a violation that I love. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, steam train plowing through Tomorrowland. And yet, I'm not aware of anyone ever complaining about that. Any, any, anyone who isn't a fussy, you know, design Nazi like we are, you know. Um, then going further into one of the lands, in this case I chose Adventureland, this is where it's really important to maintain the environment and to maintain the idea of where you are. So now there are no more um, obvious anachronisms. And the placemaking extends from the building exteriors to the shops and restaurants inside. The outdoor attractions are 100% themed. But there's one more threshold, which is you know, stepping across the threshold into an attraction. And, um, it's, believe it or not, there's a debate that goes on, like, well, then should the name of the attraction be on the attraction? If it's like the Haunted Mansion, they wouldn't have put the Haunted Mansion. <laughs> you go, oh, my God, we've gone too far into the wormhole. <laughs> you have to let people know where they're going. <laughs> but these are the kinds of, you know, debates and discussions that, that need to happen. So... In the case of Indiana Jones, you're going further and further, and you know, there, now you cannot hear park announcements or the shots of the Jungle Cruise boat you know, next door 
you are contained within an absolute um, hermetic, hermetically themed and story-driven environment. From the loading area to the first scene, you know, um, right on up to, you know, all of this has to be timed right down to the second because you've got a dispatch interval of the vehicles. Um, the explosions have to, you know, take place at a certain time. So this is really like getting into the nitty gritty. And so that's kind of the last, you know, deepest layer of the, um, of the six degrees of, of story. So you have to, um, you have to deploy story or narrative um, appropriately, and context is everything. So um, you wouldn't apply the same rules um, that you would apply to a show like The American Adventure, uh, which is at Walt Disney World, which is a highly emotional show. It's a 30-minute show, and um, it's got audio animatronics. It's really like a Broadway-quality show. You wouldn't apply those rules to Dumbo, and yet, Discussions take place to this day about, well, why does Dumbo have a door on his side? An elephant wouldn't have a door on his side. <laughs> and, oh my God, here we go again. <laughs> why are there 12 Dumbos? <laughs> Isn't that like 12 Santa Clauses? <laughs> so one of the great uh, Imagineers, designers who came from the animation side of things was Mark Davis. And, you know, you just look at the drawing and nothing else is required. You don't need any more information. You don't need a sign. You don't need to know what the names of the raccoons are or who their mothers were or any backstory. The images um, speak for themselves and have their own appeal, uh, you know, on their own. And he had a discussion with Walt Disney one time about this. And Mark said, rides should be what people don't expect them to be. And it doesn't have to do a lot with continuity of story or plot. It does have to do with the entertainment value of surprise and seeing things that you can't see anywhere else. He claims that Walt and he were in agreement on this point. Walt knew that we were not telling stories. He and I discussed it many times, and he said very definitely, you can't tell story in this medium. Well, I don't know if I would 100% agree with that, but I, I you know, uh, agree with the sentiment that not everything has to have layers of story on top of it. Well, I showed you Adventureland a few slides ago, and I said it was almost a 100% anachronism-free environment. But if you're familiar with some of these locales around the world, you'll realize that this is a mashup of um, Caribbean, South American, North African, and Southeast Asian architecture slammed together beautifully, I think, poetically, in a way that only film um, people and theater people could do. And I think that's way over most guests' heads as they walk through there. It's a wonderful feeling space, but it's not free of anachronisms. And um, so just to kind of throw that out there, it, pastiche is the, you know, kind of the word that we use for places like that. And, and places within Disneyland are generally pastiches. Uh, whereas when you get to Animal Kingdom in Walt Disney World or World Showcase, once you're in those particular locales, they do maintain those uh, locales very almost religiously. Different, different CC and R's for different parks. Um, taking poetic license. So, you know, once upon a time we used to name attractions like Space Mountain. What is a Space Mountain? <laughs> I don't know, but somehow it worked. There, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a poetic term. Uh, Somehow, recently, the whole idea of story-driven this and story-driven that has led us to attraction names like Monsters, Inc., Mike, and Sully to the rescue. And I don't know how many syllables that is, but I know that guests just call it the Monsters, or the Monsters, Inc. ride. And so it's something to keep in mind, like what do the users really do? How, how, you know, what do they really say? How do they really pronounce it? Um, and, you know, the graphic it's going to be more expensive, right? It's going to be bigger. <laughs> more words. Um, this looks like, at first glance, it might be something that one of our competitors or someone who's trying to be Disney or imitate Disney uh, would try to do. And yet, it's a very important and clever um, placemaking device that has been employed in Animal Kingdom in Florida 
um, to really convince you that you are, not only are you not in Kansas anymore, but you're not in a Disney theme park <laughs> anymore. It, it breaks our graphic rules and it breaks our um, Disney character modeling <laughs> rules. And I'm sure there were some people in the corporate end of the company that were hemorrhaging um, when they heard that this was coming. But it's such an important piece of the, uh, of the story when you walk into this area, which is Af uh, Africa on the left, and that's um, Asia on the right, Southeast Asia on the right. So now we're into tricks of the trade. These are just some little, this is really where this whole idea started, or just like, what are the things that were handed down that I remember, um, you know, some of the original Imagineers telling me, or, or things that maybe I've discovered myself um, that seem to be true. And one of them is the power of twisting and turning, uh, not only as you are a pedestrian, through one of our parks, but also you know, on a ride vehicle, meandering through one of the um, attraction, attractions or shows. And the more you twist and turn and the more contrasts there are, um, the more intriguing the attraction is going to be. So how many people have been to Venice, Italy? It's nothing like Venice, California. <laughs> um, so if you've been to Venice, generally what happens is, um, that's Venice in one square mile. Ven almost all of Venice fits inside of one square mile, which surprises people. I used to think that was baloney when one of the architects would say that. And then I looked it up, and it's like, oh, yeah, it is. It really is. Um, so those points that you see there, uh, let's see if I can spotlight it. Ooh, spotlight. Sometimes it wants to work, and sometimes it doesn't. Well, up on the upper left corner, is the um, train station, kind of the transportation center that most people come into Venice on. And then they take a long journey either through a water taxi or uh, some kind of watercraft uh, to get to their hotel, which is usually in the, generally in the area of the, um, yeah, generally that area is where most of the hotels are and most of the um, tourist activity takes place, although the whole you know, thing is really wonderful. And so if you're there long enough, you will work your way up um, to all of the kind of nooks and crannies. But the general path, the general flow that most people um, take as pedestrians on their one or two days that they're in Venice is seen kind of in that, within that yellow um, circle there. So they'll go from St. Mark's Square down there, and the Bridge of Size is over there and they'll meander across the bridge, and they'll see the um, Peggy Guggenheim Museum and uh, where they make the gondolas, and there's all sorts of great little galleries and um, you know, shops and things like that, kind of the more high-end stuff. And then they'll eventually work their way to the Rialto Bridge. And, um, and then their feet will be tired because it will be like, have been three or four hours, which will have seemed like seven or eight hours, and then they don't realize how close they are. It's like, oh my God, we have to go back to the hotel, but it's actually a really short distance to go back to the hotel, but not really because there's so, that's where kind of the middle of the road um, shops are where you can get a lot of deals and a lot of really cool stuff. So you might end up taking another 45 minutes, even though it's a short distance, going from the bridge back to your hotel. But then, you know, you get back to the hotel and then you sleep because you're exhausted and and overwhelmed by all the canals and narrow little alleys and courtyards, and it's so amazing. So if we were to overlay that on one square mile over San Jose, and if we were at the Rialto Bridge right now, St. Mark's Square would be that um, tall building, the Price Waterhouse building. That's right down the street, you can see it from here. And the San Lucia, station would be, there's a Target and the um, SAP Center would be over there. And so suddenly Venice doesn't seem exactly that, um, that large, that humongous, that endless. There's, there's a sense of endlessness to it because everything is so dense and so weaving and labyrinth-like. And so within that would be San Pedro Square, the Children's Art Museum, City Hall is up there, um, next to where many of you are staying at the um, Clarion Hotel. And so suddenly, in fact, there it is, there's the square mile. That's where we are, that's San Jose. 
So suddenly Venice isn't like this huge, endless um, place, but it, it just tells you the effect and the power of all of that twisting and turning, and there's a lot of shadow play um, that affects us as animals, you know, that's kind of baked into our DNA about when you see shadows um, moving at a faster rate, which is really what's happening when you're going along a curve, because there's a canal in the middle of all of that. So as you're moving along the canal, the shadows are actually progressing across the, um, the building facades at a faster rate, and it's all very subliminal. So that's that. <laughs> uh, movie backlots are another thing where a lot of the tricks of the trade came from. Um, the idea of, on the end of a main street, of putting some kind of a building there, uh, that's not a typical arrangement in an American town, but you see it in films a lot, like Back to the Future and any number of films. Um, there's always like a city hall, town hall, uh, the civic you know, center or whatever, they put in, in this little area here, it's because it, it's good for the camera, it looks good on the camera. Uh, it doesn't look good when there's kind of a, a vacant spot, the vanishing point goes to nothing. So there are exceptions, of course, in New York, there's the Flatiron Building and, you know, there are towns and there, there are these setups, but it's not typical, yet it's typical in, in film. And the whole idea of, you know, back lots where you can um, twist and turn and, you know, you're, you're on in Ireland on one moment and then Italy the next and Spain the next. And they would set up, they're not very big. I mean, all, you know, these back lots are, what you're seeing there might be an acre or an acre and a half, but they can really milk the, um, the shots um, by going, you know, both ways, left to right, right to left, on a very small um, surface area of buildings. And then the idea of, you know, the idyllic town square. Um, and this whole idea of keeping the real world out started a little bit with, um, with studios. Many of them built berms around um, so that you couldn't see the oil derricks, which were all over Los Angeles at the time. Um, so you couldn't see any of that or power lines. Um, so the whole idea of sequencing and revealing and, and squeezing these, um, these different worlds together um, that you see at Disneyland are, are remnants of the film industry where all of the designers of Disneyland, the original designers, came from. And they didn't just come from Disney or Disney Animation. Uh, they came from 20th Century Fox and Warner Brothers and Paramount and the other studios. Now the idea of wayfinding through the parks, and Disneyland has this kind of hub and spoke system um, that I think was uh, something that Walt Disney must have seen and liked in Paris because he went there almost every year starting in the 1930s, so it must have had, made some impression. Um, but this idea of hubs and spokes and weenies, you know, goes back even before Paris, the Forbidden City, you know, is uh, set up on a series of axes and portals um, that are all kind of designed to control uh, your vista, to control your emotions, and you know, to make you proud of where you are or excited to be where you are. And at the end of all of these vistas are what Walt Disney would call weenies. <laughs> uh, but in Paris, you know, you've got like um, statues and monuments and fountains at the end of all of these. And Disneyland kind of has that same thing going on with the castle and, you know, all of these high vertical elements that become the weenies that draw you to the far end of the, and the different um, axes of the park. So now we're going to take a little deep dive, well, a quick deep dive into um, spatial manipulation and Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, you know, part of the success of that attraction, not only, you know, the great music and the um, deployment of audio animatronics, but just, you know, the whole sense of where did we go? You know, and, and this is a really good example of a journey that's 15 minutes long, but it seems much longer, and it seems like you just went to another world. And that was, you know, partly because you do go underground a little bit. And there's a lot of twisting and turning involved. Um, and a lot of, you know, if you were to actually look at the plan of the attraction, you'd see how close some of these different or disparate um, locations are to one another. There's even a kitchen in the middle of all of it that you're right, almost right next to um, in the beginning part of the attraction. That's the up ramp, and that's a scene that's right underneath the up ramp. 
and that ship's mast is actually a column that's holding the, the ramp up. And all of these different locations, the end of the attraction in the arsenal, the kitchen for the Blue Bayou, <laughs> the down ramp, the Blue Bayou itself, are all within about 30 feet of one another. They are all taking place there, and you would have no idea. So it's, um, it speaks to not only the power of twisting and turning and clever attraction de design, uh, but it also speaks to res resourcefulness, um, because they were kind of forced into that box. Uh, they couldn't get any more space because there were already sewers and um, you know, utilities that surrounded that building. So the designer, Claude Coates, had to think of how he was going to squish all of that stuff together and did a magnificent job. I always think about, well, what if I was given that task? I probably would have complained, like, wow, you know, it needs to be bigger. It's got to be bigger. And, um, but, you know, it's amazing what you can do in 30,000 square feet. And another trick, this just goes back to, like, the Art of Animation book, um, The Power of the Silhouette, and, you know, I think one of the other artists, maybe it was Herb Ryman or someone, you know, always said, look at your work in silhouette. You know, that's one of the tricks. Another trick is to look at it backwards in a mirror um, to see if it's still powerful, if it still works. This little Jiminy Cricket thing was in one of those how-to books. Um, so, you know, one angle of the cricket, you could tell what it is. The other angle, you can't tell what it is. So when I worked on the castle uh, for Disneyland Paris, I, I used that trick. I remembered it and did a little test um, overlaid on top of the drawing that I, that I had done, the pencil drawing, just to see if it was still powerful, and it seemed to be. And then the whole idea of portaling, you know, these, these thresholds that you cross become really important bookmarks um, in the attraction, in the sequence of events, and how you get from one scene to the other. It can be almost as important as the scene itself. So, if, you know, come up with clever ways to do it, it really becomes powerful and memorable. This is a great scene that uses mirrors to fool you into thinking you're going into a hole at the end of the Roger Rabbit attraction. Then the other thing is staging and shape language and, and you know, blocking in the major elements of the scenes. And I borrowed these from an ex-production designer that was at Disney Animation named Hans Bacher. He did a whole book on these little scene setups um, that are wonderful. And they reminded me of you know, the work that Mark Davis and Claude Coates did for setting up you know, how Pirates of the Caribbean would look. So that silhouette there you know, becomes something that uh, is very familiar, I think, to this audience anyway. Has anyone not been to Disneyland? Go sometime. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Uh, forced perspective is another trick, but there's also this, um, you know, kind of a misconception that Disney invented forced perspective, and of course they didn't. Um, and then there's another misconception that, no, it was, you know, uh, invented by the film industry. And it's like, no, it wasn't invented by the film industry. It goes way back to Greek and Roman theater. This was in a museum in Verona, Italy, with a forced perspective stage. Uh, but Disney uses it effectively um, in shows like Pirates of the Caribbean and on outdoor architecture like the castle and Main Street. And sort of cleverly on the old mine train, which actually was very clever because from this point of view, you couldn't tell that you were going from 9 tenths scale on the bottom to 50 percent scale on the next level, but if you took the mule ride through it, suddenly you were looking down on those little buildings that were only this tall, so it was kind of goofy, but uh, still kind of fun in a way, because it's very theatrical. It makes things more approachable. That's another advantage. It also saves money, <laughs> uh, but that's kind of a, a fringe benefit to it. It really makes Main Street very um, welcoming and childlike in a way, um, and Different buildings employ different um, levels, different degrees. It's, that's almost no forced perspective because that's a practical floor on the upper level. So it goes from like almost 100% on the ground level to like 
on the upper level. But here you go from 90% at the bottom to 80 to 70, and similarly over here. So even different rules within the same area. Uh, special effects are very tricky. You have to plan them out. You can't just decide, oh, we're going to have, why don't we have something disappear here? Um, because you've got giant mirrors or glass or some kind of bulky apparatus that uh, might need to be adjacent to that effect. So it's really important to, um, to plan those things out. That's a really cool effect on the right from a Tokyo Disneyland attraction where this thing that's right before your face just disappears. But if you don't do it right, if you don't completely do your homework, or if you rely too much on, on projected or reflected media, um, you can have results that are less than satisfying. So it's just, you know, it's all in the artist's hands, really. It's the same equipment and the same amount of money to do it right as it is to do it wrong. This shows you the power of using ultraviolet, what we call black light, uh, in the attractions because you can really create um, an amazing... Now, this picture is horrible because you can see the speakers and it just looks sad even with, you know, despite the fact that that earned, you know, because it's Eeyore, but also <laughs> um, the lighting is sad. But when you turn on the ultraviolet light, it suddenly hides the speakers. You can't see them. Those same speakers are right there, but you can't see them. You can't see a lot of the mechanical equipment. Uh, it becomes a more magical, um, enchanting environment. Pirates of the Caribbean, to go back to that, um, uses another kind of uh, rule of thumb, which is the sky walls um, are about 40 feet away from you. If you get closer than 40 feet, um, you be can begin to detect that there's a wall there. So your sense of stereoscopic 3D stops at about 40 feet. So that's why the ceiling is up about you know, 30 to 40 feet, and the walls in this scene are 40 feet away from you, which really makes it highly effective. It, it, you know, with the correct lighting, it makes it disappear and you can't tell that there's a wall and pipes and stuff that are on that wall. These are other kind of scenic, you know, uh, rules of thumb. These, these are all, you know, kind of simple scenics uh, that don't cost a lot of money that work in the particular um, instance of pirates or in the case of this is a soundstage on the 20th century Fox lot. It's still there, but it's covered up with a lot of other gack now. But that's all flat. Everything is flat. There's a door. That door is there. And that horizontal thingy is uh, an air conditioning duct. And except for that, everything else is flat. And it was needed to fill in. It was intruding on a scene that was being shot there. And the art director said, oh my god, you can see the soundstage. And it was a New York. Um, scene, I think it was Hello Dolly, it was a New York turn of the century street scene, so that he had one of the scenic artists paint, you know, come up with this design for the side of the soundstage that you see in the film for about five seconds. <laughs> but it's really, like, it fools you, like, birds run into that <laughs> building, they try to land on the awnings down there, like, one guy came back and there was a dead bird on the hood of his car. Uh, another important thing to remember is that theming is not like a condiment that you squirt onto the attraction or onto the um, building, you know, um, to try to disguise the, you know, the banality of the building or uh, the fact that, you know, the, the proportions of the building don't even make sense for the setting that you're trying to create. And this is an important thing that my colleague Joe Rohde always brings up, you know, that he, he says that theming is not a um, noun, it's a verb, or no, it's not a verb, it's a noun. It's something that has to be put in place um, at the very beginning, and you don't say, and now go theme it. Um, and he's right, even though I still say that. Uh, so this is a, a building that Joe Rohde helped um, art direct. It's a, one of the hotels at Walt Disney World, and it does not have, you know, kind of that stench of a Las Vegas hotel, because there are you know, hundreds if not a couple thousand units in this hotel, yet it doesn't seem like a big industrial kind of a building. Because if it had, it would have just completely um, canceled out the idea uh, that you're trying to convey. Now this um, chapter 
again, you're only seeing little, kind of like I cherry-picked some of the uh, pages for each of these chapters. Um, this is about approaching things uh, in a different way. This will be uh, your home, where I can find you always. No, no, no! Yes, yes, yes! That was the scene that came to mind when I saw this uh, travesty. <laughs> Uh, in one of our parks at the It's a Small World attraction. Uh, none of the other Small World attractions have a jail kind of, you know, set up <laughs> uh, with a hand railings. And um, the, this joke was not appreciated by the architect, but I, I did it anyway. <laughs> uh, but you have to, you know, see through the eyes of a child. Remember, like, what would that be like if you were only, you know, 36 inches high, and I'm not very far from that, you know, I'm like, 42 is the legal um, handrail, and, uh, you know, so children and short people are looking through a, a thing like this at something that's very beautiful, you know, beyond, um, so that has to be kept in mind. Um, doing more with less is probably the hardest, one of the hardest things to um, try to practice because everyone wants to do more with more. Because <laughs> you got more. Um, but that was just a scene that showed you, you know, look how kind of almost amateurish and, um, you know, that looks like a high school project almost. But it didn't when the ultraviolet lights came on because professionals knew what it was gonna look like with the lights turned on. And this was done back in the days when Disney didn't, believe it or not, have much money. But even in Pirates of the Caribbean, which is considered one of the granddaddies and one of the, you know, the, the pinnacles of attraction design, it um, kind of relies on some shortcuts, clever shortcuts. So a lot of the sets are just plywood or even fabric that's flat and scenically painted. But this scene here kind of shows you three different things. You've got uh, Pyrocure rock work, that's pyrocure there, it's like a thick foil. So some of the rock work is made out of foil. Some of the rock work is made out of plaster. It's plaster where there's water, where there's no water, it transitions and becomes foil. In that scene, you see the foil and the plaster and the fort, which is made out of carved plaster on the bottom and painted on plywood on the top. Does anyone know that? No. Um, so Disney, you know, saved a few nickels. They were hemorrhaging money on this attraction at the time because it went way over budget. So they employed some um, clever shortcuts. I mean, that's how bad it looks up close. Oh, that's the set that's made. Um, all of the village sets are made out of fabric. And I found this shot that showed, because someone took it with a flash picture, and so you can see the, uh, the studs behind it. It's just fabric, painted. And we made three pirates that way, but the fourth one was all plaster, which costs much more money. And I'm like, why? You can't tell the difference. When the, when the show lighting comes on, you can't tell the difference. This is about how you work and how there was a little bit about this earlier about collaboration, collaborating with people and, and building upon the last idea instead of just saying, no, that won't work. Um, this is like, well, yes, if. And this is a case of, you know, in the Tiki Room, there's that weird fountain that comes up that seemingly holds itself together, the magic fountain. And when the designer first approached the engineer, the engineer said, no, you can't do that because, you know, water is going to, uh, the surface tension is going to, scatter it apart once it gets above two feet. You can't do it. Um, and then another engineer said, yes, you can do it if you take a glass tube, and that glass tube is really long, and if you build a basement <laughs> below the floor that the glass tube can drop into, so they built a basement because they needed a basement anyway. That, that's the basement there. That's what it looks like under the tiki room. I nicked that off of the internet because someone had an episode of the TV show that showed that a long time ago. Another one that's kind of hard to always keep in mind and keep in practice is just respecting the, the fragile quality of beauty and stillness. So not everything has to 
be kinetic. Not everything has to be, I mean, kinetic things are great, so there's some places that could use more kinetics, but there's some things that just need to be, you know, left alone and simple for their beauty and for what, how they make you feel. You know, I, I love to just sit in some of these places and, uh, and contemplate the meaning of life. Um, and there's not enough of those kinds of places in a Disney park or in any kind of a, a place for that matter. It goes back to that special quality um, that that earlier slide spoke to. Now, this is kind of a fun one because um, you have to break the rules. There's just, you know, it's, <laughs> you have to come up with a set of rules or guidelines. Um, otherwise, you just have kind of this anarchy um, which comes up, which shows, which you can feel in, in some of the product. But if you become you know, too much of a design Nazi, uh, it can backfire and work against you. So, some, so I already showed you places where the rules are broken and, and you don't really even know it. Why is there a castle on the end of Main Street? And New Orleans Square, which is highly, highly authentic, uh, the architect studied, he was a great architect to begin with, and he went to New Orleans numerous times, and he did an incredible job of recreating New Orleans, except it's not on a grid. That was Walt Disney or Herb Ryman's idea to put it all cattywampus so that you had to twist and turn your way through it so that it seemed bigger than it really is. And the Matterhorn it doesn't look exactly like the real Matterhorn. Um, it's been softened and made a little bit more like an ice cream sundae. <laughs> um, and that was just, you know, to disnify it a little bit and to make it, again, a little bit more huggable or a little more approachable. After all, it was going to be an attraction that's a little bit terrifying uh, for people if they've never been on a roller coaster. And why are there Skyway buckets going through it, for that matter? Um, I like to think that Walt Disney must have um, had some kind of affinity or knowledge for the Dakota tribe and, you know, their motto of use everything you know, use all of the buffalo. Uh, Walt Disney also liked to kill two birds with one stone. Uh, not literally, but um, he liked, you know, th again, they didn't have a lot of money, so they had to make things work. And so this ugly apparatus that held up the Skyway just um, got covered up by the Matterhorn. And he killed two birds with one stone and got to keep the Skyway ride instead of tearing it down. Um, and then here, when they redid Tomorrowland, they moved those cypress trees. Instead of throwing them away, they moved them next to the Haunted Mansion, where it helped support um, that scene better. Here's one that I like to, when I take people to Disneyland and give them kind of the, the nickel tour, um, I take them to this wall at the end of East Center Street. So you go up Main Street, and halfway up Main Street on the right, there's this side street. And at the end of the side straight is this brick wall, and I show them that brick wall, and I go, what do you think of that brick wall? And they go, oh, that's a nice brick wall. Anything wrong with it? No. But, oh, that must have been one of the transitions I added to it. Can I go back? Ah. Oh. Okay, so, oh, yeah, here we go. So look at it more carefully. It's all screwed up on the right. It's all like Lucy did it. For those of you who knew, know Lucy, I love Lucy. <laughs> um, and that's because that's a test wall. That was the first surface area on Main Street. And um, they had plaster carvers, which was a specialty trade, because in California you don't have a lot of brick, real brick buildings or stone buildings. So they had plaster carvers that would come in and, pla and carve the plaster. And so this was his little training wall. And he started on the right, and then by the time he got to the left, he figured it out. That wall has been there since 1955, and no one has ever complained about it. And nowadays, you'd have people saying, Walt Disney would never approve, and his family wouldn't. And they bring up all this stuff, and you're like, what are you talking about? You know, it's a cool thing, actually. It's, a, it's like a thing to talk about. It's kind of neat, you know, and it's off on the side. It's not, you know, it's not in the center. It's not the center of attention. If it was something on, like that on the castle, you wouldn't do it, obviously. 
So um, that's kind of a nice segue into pitfalls and myths and this quote by Herb Ryman, which was an ironic quote about bad taste costs no more, meaning it costs uh, the same amount to do a bad job as it does to do a good job. And yet a lot of people you know, do the bad job uh, because they don't do the research or they're not trained properly. And sometimes some of that creeps into the park, although thankfully uh, it's usually not noticed. And this is another kind of thing where Again, the story begins to trump the experience, you know, the, the need to hang on too closely to the story. Um, when you transfer an idea, a book, into a movie, or a movie into a play, or a play back into a movie, you have to make some changes. You have to make adaptations. That's why you always hear that term, you know, best adaptation. You can't, sometimes you can, but most of the times you can't. So when they first did the Snow White ride, they stuck to the book and, and made it first person so that you were Snow White, which really sounds good on paper, and that's probably what I would have done too. But they overlooked the simple fact that a kid wants to see the star of the film, Snow White. It's called the Snow White ride, so where's Snow White? Well, you're supposed to be Snow White. So people didn't get that, and it took about 15 years to, you know, before they finally changed it. Uh, but it really kind of shows, again, think like a kid. You've got you know, you to think like a kid, and you've got to break the rules. So in the attraction, you, know, you see Snow White, and, and it isn't exactly the same sequence of, uh, as you see in the film. You have to make the best experience uh, for the particular platform that you're designing to. Uh, again, going too far with the theming and not thinking things through all the way. So this is a beautif beautifully themed wall, marvelous piece of plaster work, and this kid can't see what's on the other side of it, which is quite beautiful, because it's 42 inches tall. I could barely see over the thing. And it, ironically, became a little bit of a safety concern, too, because people wanted to see what's on the other side, so they can kind of, they can't really get up on it, but they're trying to get a toehold on some of those stones. You know, why not just make it an open wrought iron thing that they can look out and see? And this is another one, uh, again, like, you know, being too, paying too much allegiance to the story and not taking uh, account of the experience. So that, it's a beautiful wall. That's an even taller one. That one's six feet tall because that's not a wall for safety. That's a wall so you can't see what's on the other side from this dining area. And the reason they didn't want you to see what's on the other side is because that's Beauty and the Beast and you're sitting in the, I mean, that's the Little Mermaid, and you're sitting in the Beauty and the Beast area, and you can't have two stories, you know, interfere with one another. I'm like, give me a break. <laughs> have you walked around Disneyland? You know, Dumbo is spinning around in front of Snow White, and Snow White is next to Pinocchio, you know. Uh, so they spent a lot of money for that wall that hides a beautiful scene that people could be enjoying while they're sitting down and relaxing and having a snack. So. Sometimes it costs less to create a better um, experience. Um, being heavy-handed, so this is something that can be with audio, with lighting, with special effects, too much of a good thing. So the scene is in Peter Pan, which is beautiful, is eliminated, with, again, with black lights. So at one point in the evolution of the attraction, a lighting designer thought, well, if 10 black lights are a good thing, then 100 black lights would be 10 times better, right? And it just created this um, overlit situation where you're aware of the source points of the light, and it's so bright you can see the walls, which aren't 40 feet away, but more like, you know, 10 feet away, and you can tell that the walls were there, and it looked like a big scene that was lit with black lights instead of like a magical where are we kind of experience. Um, the inauthenticity of um, things that sometimes creep into our parks because someone did not do their research. You know, there were not doors that were shaped like that uh, in the time period that is expressed on Main Street. Um, now this one, I don't know, this really got lost in translation somehow. So I think this might have been a student architect. <laughs> uh, and they must have gotten the 
directive on the phone or something like, okay, the building's got to have like, you know, it's like an old Italian building and it's got plaster, but the, you know, you know how the buildings there are made out of stone and then they'd plaster it over and then the plaster would chip away and expose the stone underneath. And this person just didn't get it. And so <laughs> the stone, you know, like fell off in kind of this like Lego way, in a way that would never happen. Um, whew, I don't know how things like that happen. Lack of research. Or this, you know, simple light post uh, that's at the entrance of Disneyland right now that it, instead of having clear glass or transparent glass where you can actually see the, the flame, it, for some reason it's got a white opaque. I thought it was just a Band-Aid, but it's been there now for a couple years like that, so weird, but it's something you can sense. Now, these shortcuts, how am I doing on time, by the way? Are you bored yet? <laughs> um, there are shortcuts that don't work, you know, so everything is relative to the space and to the lighting condition and to the distance that you are from it. So someone took that scenic uh, painting idea that you see in the Haunted Mansion and, and Pirates and other places, and they employed it outside in a way that you can tell that it's painted. So they were trying to tie the two things together, but it's like it didn't quite work. Or like, okay, maybe we don't have to make them dimensional uh, pillars. We can just you know, make them cutouts. And like, no, it looks like cutouts. It looks cheesy. So not all shortcuts work. Um, that's where you kind of have to you know, either experiment or you have to have professional tribal knowledge handed down to you from someone who knows whether it's going to work or not. So the whole business, you know, the more you get into it, the more of a paradox you realize that it is. Because, you know, when do you know where you're, when you're overthinking something versus when you're underthinking something? You know, how do you know when, uh, how much is too much or how little is not enough? You know, when is more better versus less is more? And, um, you know, if you're looking up there where it's not finished, uh, then the problem is you don't have a good thing going on down here. Well, that's true sometimes, but it's not true all the time because if the thing that you didn't finish up here is obvious enough, it's going to draw your attention away from the thing that you're supposed to be looking at. So both sentiments are correct. It just depends on you know, all of the prevailing circumstances. This is a brilliant page or brilliant graphic that the designer Bruce Mao, who we at Disney brought in as a consultant um, did to kind of express, you know, the two different um, ways of looking at um, taking no for an answer. And, and these are actual um, comments from some of the Imagineers. He polled um, several dozen Imagineers and he, and, and basically they fell in these two camps. And, you know, which one is right? Well, there is really no right or wrong. Again, it kind of depends on the, on the circumstance. But it's, it's, I just find it you know, interesting, like the two different um, points of view from people who share the, ultimately the same goals and objectives. So Christopher Alexander, the famous architect who you know, started, was one of the first people to kind of talk about the special qualities that are uh, required for a successful environment, created a thing called the paradox circle, and I just, redid it with kind of the problems that uh, are encountered at Disney parks, you know, the, the paradoxes of um, doing a seamless um, blend, or I'm sorry, like up on the upper two o'clock, you have um, expensive must-haves, and then you have thoughtful shortcuts, and then somewhere in the middle you have the, the blend of the two, which was what I showed you on Pirates of the Caribbean. So all of these kind of show you how different aspects or different design problems have, you know, these two polar um, ways of approaching the same problem. It's why you can't come up with a hard, fast guideline. How do you know when you're overthinking versus underthinking? Uh, you know, I, I can hear the discussions in my head that took place. This was before I worked there, but, you know, these areas that show up that are unfinished 
And so, again, it's like, well, if they're looking up there, that means you didn't do enough down here or whatever. And it's like, well, I don't know. You know, I, that tree was probably placed there to disguise it, but then it overgrew. And, uh, and then there was this problem, you know, in another part of, this is Disney World in Florida, you know, the Hall of Presidents. And that was eventually addressed uh, with some architecture up there that, because it, ne it never went away. They thought the trees would disguise it, but um, not from most points of view. And you have these paradoxes, you know, when you're designing something, how do you approach the design of, say, like an old fantasy land kind of environment? Do you, do you keep it real and authentic, like this picture on the left that's kind of like what you'd really see in, you know, in England somewhere? Um, or do you go like wacky, like, um, like Toontown? Is that too unreal? Is the one on the left too real? Somewhere in the middle just right? kind of a Goldilocks thing. So these are all the kinds of polar um, discussions and, and um, you know, thinking that has to go on uh, when, you, when you begin to establish the, the placemaking. This is like, I rem another thing that they're like, you know, people, grown adults actually argue about this. Like, we, we need to take that out because there, there's a crack. It's really made out of wood. It's a beautiful sculpture of a bear. It's in a bar in, um, in Florida at Walt Disney World, and it naturally developed a crack. And so, oh my God, we can't have that. There are no cracks in you know, Disney World. I'm like, what? <laughs> um, and then there's another camp that's like, no, it's serendipity. It's just that's how it would be. That's what it would look like if you really went into a wilderness um, you know, environment like that. And then another person's like, but it's a safety hazard. And another person's like, no, they could stick gum in there. You have to take it. I'm like, oh my God, really? So. How can something so simple become a, a point of debate? But these are, again, the paradoxes and the kinds of decisions that you have to um, think about. Oh, this wait. is my biggest problem all my life is money. It takes a lot of money to uh, make these dreams come true. From the very start, it was a problem of getting the money to open Disneyland. A lot of people don't realize that we had some very uh, serious problems here, keeping this thing going, getting it started. Uh, I remember when we opened, if uh, anybody recalls, we didn't have enough money to finish the, the landscaping. And I had uh, Bill Evans go out and put uh, Latin uh, tags on all of the weeds. <laughs> and, uh, we had a lot of inquiries about the <laughs> Current events notwithstanding. <laughs> but this was kind of a, I forgot to set it up. But, you know, there's a lot of loftiness that goes on at these kinds of um, gatherings. Not this one, but maybe the one that's, you know, several yards away. Or on LinkedIn, there's a lot of this kind of lofty, you know, if you can dream it, you can do it. Um, and, or, you know, quality, quality, quality. Never accept anything less than the finest, you know. And you go, well, if you do that, you may never get started <laughs> or you may never finish because at some point you've got to stop and then you've got to learn from what you created so that you can take the next step and evolve and so you know like the old man said you know the way to get started is to stop talking and begin doing and so that whole thing about Walt and money and like ha 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 and we just you know finally had to just plant weeds and put little signs to fake people into thinking that it was intentional. <laughs> um, it's so opposite from things that you read, you know, these inspirational, motivational things that um, call up kind of all of these impossible things that nobody here really can really do because we're all just, you know, have our nose to the grindstone and have to experiment and have to put something out there and go on to the next thing. So I'm afraid that that is the end of the presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>